Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Conversations on Food Justice, a series co-hosted by Food and Society at the Aspen Institute and Share Our Strength. I'm Corby Kummer, Executive Director of Food and Society. Today, we're thrilled to bring together five faith leaders to discuss faith and food justice. Across faith, leaders are mobilizing their communities to tackle food insecurity from all angles, from local efforts to distribute food and resources to families in need, to advocating for more equitable social and economic policies that can move the needle on poverty and increase calls for social justice. This work is nothing new for communities of faith who've long played a role in shaping policy and community activism. All our panelists today have deep and broad experience. And also I'm really excited about this subject because we all have our pet themes for this series. And this is one I've been really eager to hear about. We couldn't be more fortunate today to be joined by the Reverend Eugene Cho, president and CEO of Bread for the World, Anwar Khan, president and co-founder of Islamic Relief USA, Abby J. Liebman, the president and CEO of Mazon, Preet Singh, founding and managing director of Khalsa Food Pantry. I'm even luckier to have my colleague Simran Jeet Singh, the executive director of Aspen Institute's Religion and Society program as moderator. Simran is a dream to work with, matched only by our Share Our Strength and Food and Society at the Aspen Institute teams. A thank you to all. A quick housekeeping note, we'll address questions posted in the Q&A. Please submit your questions early and often. Um, question moderators are standing by, ready to take them at any time you'd like to enter them in. Um, Thanks to Community Language Cooperative, we have live Spanish translation. Please welcome our interpre interpreters, Alejandro Arieta and Valentina Sarmiento Cruz. Also, you, we have a post-session fireside chat with my co-host, Elliot Gaskins, whom you'll be seeing at the end of today's session, and Katie Workman, distinguished guest, immediately after our conversation on Faith and Food Justice ends today. We'll share the link in the chat, invite you to join. Simran, with pleasure and gratitude, I give you and our wonderful, generous panelists the floor and the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Corby, and, and thank you everyone for being here. It's, it's really a, a pleasure and an honor. This uh, conversation is one that's close to my heart in part uh, because I care about um, justice, and in part because I care about faith, um, and in part because I, I care about food, and, and the last one probably, probably a little too much uh, that I care about food. But it's it's really it's really an important conversation, um, especially as we look at the outsized role that religious communities historically and presently uh, have played in the fight for few food security and for food justice. So. I'm really grateful to the people on our panel today, um, both for giving us their time uh, for this conversation and to share a little bit of their insights through their work, but especially for the work they do in the world. And it's, I mean, it's just an honor to uh, be in your presence given how much you give to our world and how much you, uh, how much you serve uh, with such selflessness and passion. So I'm, I'm an admirer of, of all four of you. Um, and I would just like to jump into the conversation here. And, and perhaps I think that the place to begin would really begin, we could really begin by picking up on this, on this point that um, you know, faith-based communities and organizations have been mobilizing uh, for food security for decades. And I'd love to hear from each of you, perhaps beginning with you, Anwar, um, what does that mean to you? And why do you think why do you think it's been the case that faith-based organizations have often been leading the charge uh, for food security? Thank you, Simran. It's so wonderful to be on this uh, panel with you. I get to actually talk to you. Normally, it's one way through DMing, so this is wonderful. Um, the only thing I'd like to add to what you said is I would argue, Simran, it's not for decades. This is from millennia. Yeah. <laughs> so faiths have been working. Your faith has been doing langar since the beginning of Sikhism and since the beginning of Judaism, Islam, Christianity. It's in our theology. 
So I would argue this is our faith in action, but we don't normally hear about it. So all faiths, when I go to different places in the world and here in America, I see people of faith working and they're working quietly. And part of our nature is to be humble. The problem with being humble is that often it's the loudest voices, especially now on media that we see. So I would argue it's part of all of our faiths. It's from our theology. It's our faith in action. And myself from my own faith, I, I cannot be a believer. I cannot be a believer if my neighbor is hungry. Uh, and it says in the Quran, have you seen those that reject of the faith? It's those that reject of the orphan and urge if not the feeding of the needy. So it's not just enough to feed the needy. My colleagues here from Bread for the World and from um, Amazon, their main focus is to urge the feeding of the needy. And my colleague, a colleague from Khalsa Aid, Islamic Relief and Khalsa, we're actually feeding the needy, but feeding the needy is not enough. We need to feed the needy and urge the feeding of the needy and ask why are we in a situation for social justice that we have to feed the needy in the first place. Yeah, I, lo I love that. And Abby, I, I see you nodding along. I'd love to invite you in uh, to share your perspective on this. So I actually made some notes and my first note across the top is that Jews have been mobilizing for millennia. <laughs> so so right there with Yanmar. Um, and I, I think in modern times, I think some of that mobilization, the, the focus on issues about food insecurity have risen to the top, certainly in synagogue life, as a result of a shift in, well, first looking at ancient tradition and then a shift in the way that gets interpreted. So for Jews, the the stories that we tell, the, the Torah and, and then those stories that we retell every holiday, we just finished telling the Passover story, are often rooted in issues of justice and survival. And when you're a minority religion in America, those concepts are very present for you, I think, all the time. And I'm sure that is true for others here who represent minority religions. And, you know, Eugene, you'll talk a lot about majority religions. But the this notion that what we needed to do was step up and help people was rooted in synagogue life for a long, long time, decades, right? And then people like Leonard Fine, who was a philosopher, a thinker, a writer who actually founded Mazon, came along and said, just as Anwar did, that's not enough. We need to do more. And he shifted a conversation away from social action, as we called it, the action of helping society to justice, social justice, meaning that we needed to seek that justice. In Hebrew, the word for charity is tzedakah, um, which actually translates to justice. So this notion about justice and service and survival, I think are so woven into the modern Jewish approach to religion, to faith, to the practice of that faith, and to actualizing that faith, as Amor just referenced, right, is, is a part of the DNA of the modern American Jewish community. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. And, and so much of what you're saying resonates with, with my own perspective as a Sikh. And Breed, this might be a nice opportunity for you to jump in and, and share some of, some of your perspectives of, you know, where you come to this work as a Sikh. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for having us. And you know, it's an honor sitting next to some amazing panelists and learning more about them uh, as we have this um, these conversations. But you know, I think faith-based organizations, um, you know, they have a special fundamental outlook um, and a background that you know we or everybody brings. Um, you know, faith-based communities we give strength to challenge um, injustice and maybe a larger society. Um, the mission, maybe these communities, you know, is grounded in the belief that we have an obligation to help disadvantaged. Um, and kind of like where we started talking about the fundamentals, um, you know, in the 1400s, Guru Nanak and the Sikh faith started the concept of hunger. That tells us, well, that the food insecurity and injustice was there back then. Um, and it's, it's actually a big part of the Sikh faith and, you know, the Punjabi culture of food's always been a strong focus for our community. Um, and it's an easy way to almost break bread, right? And that concept of breaking bread and break barriers, food brings people together. Um, so I think that's where, you know, like-minded people, um, ultimately bring harmony to any project or any initiative that they see. 
that's where faith-based organizations, in my opinion, kind of mobilize that and, and have such an easy way to go into things. Um, but, you know, that's kind of what, what I see and how I see that taking place. Yeah, I, I love that. And, and Eugene, uh, over, over to you, I think if many of us are familiar with Bread for the World and we'd love to hear your perspective as, as how you come into this work. Yeah, thank you again so much. It's a pleasure and an honor to, to be on this panel and on this call. Um, you know, I think the best way for me to articulate this is that uh, how can we not be engaged in this work? Uh, for us, our faith uh, is part of our identity. It's not a clothing accessory that you wear in season or out of season. It's the very essence of who we are. So to not embody these values and convictions would in some sense be a betrayal of our own identity in many ways. Uh, and as others have said, this is part of the work that I think people within our own respective faith traditions have been engaged with for, for millennia. And I think there's, in addition to theology, there's also preservation. What I mean by preservation is that when you yourself are hungry, right? And so uh, in our faith traditions, uh, maybe within our own families, our own, own history. Uh, we've experienced hunger in our own lives. And so as a result, you're advocating not just for your neighbors, you're also advocating for yourself. Uh, you're feeding not just your neighbors, but you're feeding your own family. Uh, and then certainly, I think in all of our respective traditions, we realize that to love our neighbors is not simply to love those that look like you, think like you, feel like you, and even worship like you. Uh, hopefully more of that. Uh, 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 and as a result, for us at Bread for the World, uh, we are wanting to advocate uh, in partnership with the church, but also those who are not faith aligned uh, for the larger goal of wanting uh, to work for the common good of our society, both in our nation and around the world. Yeah, I, I res resonate with so much of what you just shared. And, you know, one of the one of the words that came into my mind as you were speaking, Eugene, was nourishment. Um, and and in, in the Sikh tradition, we learn that um, you nourish yourself by nourishing others. And, and you know, the, the other thing you said, Eugene, that I, that I really loved was um, you, you flipped a question on us. You know, my, my question was, why, why do you do this work? And, and your question is, why would you not do this work? Like this, this it's, it's such an exception in our society. Um, that, that we wonder when, when people do the good work of serving one another. Um, and then what would our world look like if, if this was taken for granted, if this was part of who we were in the way that we aspire it to be. And I, I think that's such a, a beautiful vision for us to, to imagine uh, of where we could be and, and where we want to be. Um, in thinking about this, I mean, I, I think we're, we're all seeing, it's, it's pretty clear a common thread. Each of you has spoken a bit about um, this being a very natural calling for you, uh, something that's grounded in your spirituality and in your morality as human beings. And, and I think there, there's something really interesting to observe about the commonality across religious difference. And at the same time, I, I'd, I'd be really interested to hear a little bit more from your perspectives on how this work shows up within your particular approach and your organizations. Uh, I think people on this call is, would be as interested as I am to hear a little bit more about the philosophy of what you do uh, and what your organization specifically does and uh, take it as an opportunity to, to promote uh, your organization to Unworth's point humility. Humility can be hard because uh, people don't always necessarily know what we're up to. So I think that would be a really interesting uh, next step for us in this conversation to hear about what you and your organizations are up to. Uh, maybe, maybe we can flip the order around, Eugene, and start with you this time. Uh, yeah, great question, and thank you. Um, bread for the World, uh, you can find us online at bread.org. And I think there's something really liberating in knowing that you're not the only organization or the only person that's at work in these convictions. It liberates us because it, uh, it's a reminder that the person that tries to do everything does nothing really, really well. That's been a personal philosophy of mine. And so I think our calling in our lane as a Christian advocacy organization 
uh, is to do advocacy, is to engage and to urge our lawmakers, mostly in our nation, uh, to help shape policies that will ultimately impact uh, millions and millions of people, both in our nation and around the world. So we are not implementing organizations while we are also a grassroots. We're based here in DC, but we have leaders and activists. Uh, we work with churches and we work with individuals on the ground as well. We have a bunch of organizers across the country. And uh, anytime there's anything related to hunger and uh, both in our nation and around the world. And I thought what I would share maybe briefly is maybe to, to, to articulate the values that shape our work. Um, from a religious syntax, it's probably called theology, but these values for us are, we value our faith, we value human flourishing, we value justice, we value courage and prophetic voice, we value nonpartisanship, we value collaboration, and then lastly, we value impact. Uh, all broad terms, but these are the values that guide uh, the work that we try to do. And I'm sure we might get into more of the nitty gritty stuff, but things related to SNAP, things related to child tax credit, these are all things that we're actively working on right now. But I think in addition to policies, the biggest challenge I see, or some of the biggest challenge, is to connect the grass tops with the grassroots. I think sometimes uh, we can err on one side or the other and, and both of these things matter. The origin story for bread was that it was a group of pastors about 46 years ago that got together and realized that there was a commonality within their respective congregation and parishes and it was hunger. That they had hunger issues and challenges. It was uh, an issue of justice, an issue of access. And as they were doing this work, direct feeding, uh, they began to wrestle with the question that uh, my colleague and friend Anwar mentioned earlier, like why are people in these persistent scenarios and situations? And they realized that they needed to connect the dots with policies. And uh, one of the challenges for me theologically, not personally, but within the work that we do with churches, is that some folks don't realize that politics matter, right? And we've got to connect those dots. Politics matter, because it influences policies which ultimately impact people. And whatever your faith tradition may be, we know that um, at least uh, from my perspective, God cares about people, particularly those who are marginalized or silenced or forgotten. And so that's some of the unique contributions uh, and identity of Bread for the World. Yeah, Abby, I'll, I'll pass it over to you here, and, and I'd like to. I'd love to hear some of this from your organizational perspective. Yeah, so would I. Um, I uh, I'm struck by every time one of the four of us speaks. Actually, the five of us, because you two, Simran, is how much I'm resonating with everything that people are saying. Like, oh yeah, us too. Oh yeah. That's... So Mazon, like Brad, Mazon's um, uh, about forty years old, and it grew out of this vision of, of label find that um, there was waste and, and you know, sort of squandering of food in our society and saw too much largesse around this and could see that there were people struggling with hunger um, and food insecurity um, in both the United States and, and the rest of the world. And um, he had a vision and his vision was that the Jewish community would be a part of a, a community-wide effort to end hunger. Um, that, that vision translates into our mission, which is to end hunger among people of all faiths and backgrounds. And it's, it hasn't wavered or changed because sadly that need has not wavered or changed. And, you know, Mazone. Mazon's full name is Mazon, a Jewish response to hunger. And it's not a response to Jewish hunger. Um, you know, we are really about everyone. And it's about, I think, as um, Eugene referenced, the idea of you learn from what your own experience is, but you direct that outward. And because of that, and because the, the idea that we were always small in the panoply of anti-hunger organizations, it was how do we maximize our impact? 
Well, and if you think about what it is any of us are doing, when you, we think about the direct service work that Preet and Anwar are doing, right? It's about the, your community, right? The community geographically or, or however you want to define that, right? And when we think about policy and law and lawmakers, what we think is this is how in a democracy, the community writ large expresses itself. Right? These are our priorities as a country. And what I think is shameful in the United States is that the needs of the vulnerable are never part of the priorities that are expressed by most leaders in this country. And, and we just coming out of Passover, Mazon has a, um, a, a Haggadah that we do every year. Um, then we ask a fifth question. And this year's fifth question was, when will the needs of the vulnerable become a bigger priority than the whims of the wealthy? And that is sadly the a truth. We like to ask questions. You know, Jews are all about asking questions, you know, just like the whole, this is why Passover is like a great holiday. Plus there's food. There's eating a part of all of these backgrounds, religions, cultures, because it's so fundamental, I think. And again, I think, pre, I, I, as you said, it pulls people together, crosses differences, um, creates a sense of harmony. Um, I would, I would only push back a little on this sense of being humble. And some of this may come from my own personal life experience, but um, I'm, I'm an advocate. This means that I have an obligation to step up. I am here to speak for those who are vulnerable and cannot speak or do not feel the power to speak. They feel so marginalized. They don't want to step up for out of fear. Well, that's not what an advocate is. An advocate is about taking risk and about being persistent and being visible and being bold. And that's really where Mazone's work is grounded. We focus on the populations and the issues that are either going unaddressed or underaddressed by the larger anti-hunger movement, because those persistent challenges that the larger movement looks at keep being the challenge. But we see those communities or those issues that have to be second choice as our first choice, because if we can't step up for them, who will? And one size does not fit all. This is a complex problem with complex causes. And until we really think about what is causing hunger in this country, we will be doomed to live with it. So we're very much about looking at how do we change things from how they are to how they should be. Yeah, I, I love that, Abby. And I, I think, you know, one of one of the challenges that I've observed as a, as a scholar of religion is, is that we tend to have a dichotomous stereotype of what faith is. Either it's irrational and violent, and it's part of the problem, mm -hmm. uh, or it's soft uh, yes. and passive and makes no difference. And right. I think the reality is, I mean, you, the four of you, are the reality, um, right? People on the ground, living day to day, are are rooted in action and care about action and are bold and are making a difference. And so your, your point about, you know, this false dichotomy of, of passivity uh, mm -hmm. and religion, it, it doesn't need to be part of how we think about this. And, and, and we should really be focusing on these religious communities who have been at the forefront of change for millennia, as you have pointed out. So I, I yeah, just wanted to underscore that point. I think it's super important. Uh, Breathe over to you. You've been invoked a few times now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think, you know, kind of what Abby said, it resonates the values, right? Those principles are kind of, you know, being re repeated over and over again. Um, and that just says something about, well, there's, there's that ultimate focus of humanity. Um, but um, yeah, it's just interesting to see that over and over again. So um, the Calsa Care Foundation um, opened its doors in 2009 um, in Pacoima, California. And for those that may not know, Pacoima is one of the most underserved communities in Los Angeles County. Um, it's one of the only uh, places in the valley that has uh, public housing projects. 
Um, so that kind of gave us uh, a sense that there's this area needs help um, and we can become a partner. Um, so for decades, you know, our foundation's done uh, different annual giveaways and carnivals and food stuff, um, but we felt like we needed to do more um, and we needed to be a reliable resource for the community. Um, and touching on you know, food again, it's it's just, you know, it's a big part of our faith. It's a big part of the culture, the Punjabi culture. Um, it's always been a strong focus for community. Um, and it brings people together. So I think that's, you know, where everyone can agree, it's a basic human right to have access to adequate food and, and be free from hunger. So tying that into a principle um, of Sikhism, um, where it's, you know, it's, it's seva. Um, and it's called, it's literally just meaning selfless service. Um, so acting selflessly, helping others in a variety of ways, you know, without reward or expecting personal gain. Um, that's one of the principles and values that every Sikh should be living by, um, a daily routine almost, if you will. So in 2012, we started a um, food pantry, Costa Food Pantry started, you know, we served maybe 10, 20, 50 families on a weekly basis for our first couple of years. Um, and since then, we've, op we've been open every single Friday um, as a resource for anyone. Uh, during COVID, our numbers shot up. We went over a thousand families each week. Um, we never imagined, and that scalability needed to happen. Um, that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for that community, if it wasn't for that backing, that underlying support. Um, we had to purchase refrigerated trucks, forklifts, supplies. Um, you know, volunteers had to come out in masses. Um, so partnerships ultimately had to be formed or built upon even more. And I think if you don't have that community that, um, that is your foundation, you can't do that. It's very, very difficult to go about an operation that would be possible uh, at that scale if it wasn't for those leaderships and those volunteers. And I think, you know, I, as I was researching about, um, about this, I, I found an interesting fact that in fact, 70% of the United States food pantries are run by faith-based nonprofits. Um, that's remarkable, right? How are we serving? It's because those non, but those faith-based nonprofits are stepping up. Um, and 27% of emergency shelters and halfway houses are also backed and supported and run by faith-based nonprofits. You know, that, that will leave you with that, but that's kind of huge to say that we're stepping up. We need to step up even more to support people um, in need and be that voice for the voiceless. Yeah, I appreciate that. Anwar, before we pass it over to you, um, just a reminder to folks, if they'd like to ask questions, you're welcome to uh, drop them into the Q&A. We'll be moving into, into our Q&A portion uh, in, in a short while. So we'd love to hear from you and give you the opportunity to speak to our panelists. Um, in the meanwhile, Anwar, back to you. Thank you. Um, I should have said this earlier, but a belated um, uh, blessed Vasaki to my Sikh brothers and sisters, Easter, belated Easter, well, for the, it's belated for the Anglicans and the Catholics, but not for the Orthodox. So for the Orthodox is coming up and for that, it was last week, next week. And of course, to my um, Jewish brothers and sisters, um, may you continue to have a blessed uh, Passover and we're in Ramadan as well. So I just wanted to bring that up. We, people talk about intersectionality even though we're on solar calendars, lunar calendars, um, somehow, and this is from God's uh, um, plan, we all came together. So we just need, I think, the Hindus, Buddhists, and a few more faiths, and we would have had a um, majority, but I don't think we're ever going to um, get everyone to agree with everything. But anyway, this was um, a step in the right direction. Now, Islamic Relief USA started in 1993. I was one of the co-founders. And I, as you can tell by the action, I didn't grow up here. So I grew up in England. And Preet, you keep on mentioning Punjabi. So you may be surprised. I think I'm more Punjabi than you because I was actually born in Sialkot, Punjab. I never lived there, but technically, and I've been to Guru Nanak's uh, birthplace. And next time, inshallah, I go to Pakistan and I'm gonna go to where he's buried in Pakistan, in Pakistani Punjab. So I love the idea of the Punjabi culture but there are um, many different facets of that. And so, um, yeah, absolutely. So as far as um, our faiths are, um, 
the work of Islamic Khalif, it started in England from the University of Birmingham in 1984. When some medical students went to East Africa, they were at a medical conference in Sudan and they saw refugees coming from Ethiopia. Now, the majority of the refugees that came from Ethiopia into South Sudan in 1984 were from Tigray and would therefore be Christian. So Islamic Relief actually started not because of the Middle East and not because of Muslim suffering, because of suffering of human beings who happen to be from a different continent and a different faith. And here in America, what galvanized me to come was I was tired of seeing the pictures of the bombings of Sarajevo in Bosnia and the humanitarian crisis over there. So we have been driven by humanitarian crisis. And I would argue that the way that we started is the way that many organizations who do our work start. We started with some people who felt bad and felt that there was an injustice and something needed to be done. Then they realized you need money to pay for a mission. No money, no mission then you need to actually do your mission properly. No mission, no mission. Then you need to be witness for the mission. And the point that I was making earlier, um, um, Abby, about humble, I wasn't saying that I agree with them. I'm just saying, so we were nice to be humble. We tend to come last all the time. I know it says in Christianity that the meek will inherit the earth, but it doesn't say that in the Quran that I'm aware of. So, to, and then I realized, that you have to urge the feeding of the needy. That means you can't be humble about it. You have to push it. So we ourselves went for a transition. And I believe in 2014, we actually changed our mission statement in America. And we added something at the end of it, which was um, works to empower individuals in their communities and give them a voice in the world. Now we're thinking of changing it again so that we're not giving them anything. We want to amplify the voice in the world. So to us, the direct services is the traditional things that people of faith have done. But advocacy is what's really important. And something that inspires me, by the way, you may be surprised, Dr. Cho, or maybe not, was liberation theology. And there's a Muslim version of liberation theology. And the guy that wrote it, actually, I went to university with him. He was a few years above me in University of Birmingham. So, yeah, so it's not surprising that there was a sense of justice. And I, I'm, I'm going to finish with this. I feel that when we started Islamic Relief here in America, it was about trying to help the poor overseas. Then it was about trying to help the poor here in America because there was a lot of poverty here. We grew up in England. When I left England in 1993, there were no food banks. Now there's thousands of food banks because apparently Britain went the American system and cut social welfare and believed more in the market. And now we have more hunger issues. The reason why we weren't doing that before there was a feeling that we didn't need to feed people is because welfare covered it in England. And as we became more American, now we have more food banks. With all respect, I think we all agree, all four of us, all five, everyone on this court, it would be better not to have food banks. It would be better if there aren't hungry people. So we learned from um, Dr. Eugene Cho's um, predecessor, um, one of my mentors, um, Reverend Beckman, was our teacher. We worked with our brothers and sisters in Maison. How are we going to advocate better for the people in need? And now 80% of our um, 240 local partners in America are Muslim, 20% are not. That includes Jewish, Christian, and secular organizations. And 35% of our organizations are African-American-led, 33% are women-led. We're trying to increase the diversity of the um, work that we're doing. So it's, not, so it's transactional to give food. It's transformational to work in society to see how we can prevent people from needing food in the first place and have a fairer justice for all. And religion is not about us fighting each other. For some people it is, but for the people on this call, it's about making a better world and by helping others coming closer to the divine. Yeah, I'm so I'm so glad this call is being recorded so I can go back and, and listen to it over and over again. There's so many, there's so many nuggets. Sometimes, sometimes there's so much wisdom that you can't capture it all. You know, the, the one of the last things you said on where was um, to give food can be transactional, but what would it look like to be transformational? And and that is such an important question. And um 
you know, we, we have, we, as, as a group had, had a list of questions, um, that we shared with you, um, and, and we could go down them and, but there, there's a, there's a burning question that I have that wasn't on our list. And as the, uh, all powerful moderator, uh, I'm, I'm going to scrap, I'm going to scrap the questions we had and ask you this because I imagine that people on this call, um, are part of the choir. Um, they are here because they believe in food justice. And I also imagine, you know, the, the roadmap of what our conversation has been so far has been, why do you do this work? How do you do this work, right? Those were the first two questions. And, and what I'm hearing from each of you is, I mean, there's something really beautiful about what you're saying, which is, you know, I'm, I'm doing this as a Jew or as a Sikh or as a Muslim or as a Christian, but it's not for my community, this is for all people. And again, that's not what people expect from people of faith, right? Usually we're so focused on our identities uh, and our own communities that we're not able to look beyond them. And, and what that tells me is, and what I see in each of you is that there is a gap between in our society between where we know we should be, where we want to be mm -hmm. and where we are. And I, I'm not saying any of you is, is perfect or a prophet or a guru or, or anything, but, but, but for some reason, the four of you have been able to tap into this particular area and live into this aspiration. And my question is, through your work and in your wisdom, what are some best practices to help the rest of us who do care about these issues, who are part of the choir, but haven't made this our full-time jobs? Or maybe some of us have, but what are some best practices you have seen uh, to ensure that we are getting closer to where we want to be. So that's that's my question for each of you and, and anyone who's ready to jump in. I know it, I know I'm sp springing a curveball on you, um, but sometimes the spontaneous answers and the ones straight from the heart are the best ones. So whoever's ready to jump in here, please go ahead. Okay, I'll start. So um, I, I first I want to say a little bit of something about intersectionality. So if if someone asked me to describe myself um, as a part of this call and, you know, sort of making this accessible for people who might have limited vision. I would say that I'm a woman in her 60s. I'm of Eastern European descent. I have honey blonde hair that comes to my shoulders. That's too long because of the pandemic. Um, and um, I, I was struck by I'm all of those things, right? And nowhere in that did I say I'm Jewish because whatever a Jew looks like in people's minds is, is subject to so much subjectivity, right? So, but it, it, nevertheless, I am, and I'm a woman and I lead with all of that stuff, right? So um, when I think about how I lead Mazon and what Mazon does with its leadership is that there's a balance that you have to strike be, between being a leader and that, that advocate that takes a leadership role and being an ally. So we do a lot of work with tribal nations and food sovereignty and the struggles that they've had for hundreds of years in this country. And we are an ally to them. Um, we, we've, they lead, we work with them, we support them. In work we do about military hunger, we're the lead. And this was an issue no one wanted to touch. I think what happens is people sometimes forget how poisonous some of these issues are until you know years later when it's become safe and now everybody wants to do it. And you have to, again, take risks. Um, I also think that if you are a part of this choir, um, there are things that you can do. And some of them is just shifting focus a little, right? So I have a, a, I had a friend um, who was a writer and a, a stand-up comic. And she said her grandmother used to read the newspaper this way. Good for the Jews, bad for the Jews, good for the Jews. Now, I actually don't read the paper quite that way, <laughs> um, but I sure read it as, is this good for the food insecure? Is it bad for the food insecure? I just am much more aware. Before I had this job, this is not the lens. I looked at the world through, but it shifted when I had this position and this responsibility. So I think that's one thing that people can do is, is to really think about whether you are aware of, of this issue 
And again, going back to the intersectionality, I raised that for a reason, which is that if there's a, a story about gas prices, you need to stop and think, well, what does that mean about what's left for food? And the idea that there used to be a commercial long ago when Toyota had its tagline was, what will you do with the money you save? And there was a woman who was unloading groceries and the voiceover says, what are you going to do with all the money you save? And she looks at him, raises an eyebrow and says, buy food. And it, no, that's not exactly what Toyota intended, but I took that as like, what the heck? What do you think people spend their money on? Um, and I, I think the other thing it's really important to do is to fight compassion fatigue. Um, when you when you're people who are engaged in the world and seeking justice on and issues that touch food insecurity or food insecurity itself is a long slog, and it it's hard to keep staying in this fight and feel the kind of energy and commitment that you must. And years ago, um, I helped found an organization called Jewish World Watch, which was about um, ending genocide and mass atrocities in the world. And I approached a very prominent rabbi in Los Angeles to ask if his synagogue was going to, again, be a part of this work. And he said to me, Oh, you know, we did Darfur last year. We're doing something else. And I was just ballistic, not to him, of course. I get off the phone and my my then teenage son says to me, what's the matter? I tell him what this rabbi has just said to me. And he goes, wow, I bet the Darfuris wish that they were done with it last year too, but they're not. So that's why you got to keep going. And this is what I say to myself every time I feel like I can't, get the energy up. I think the food insecure people in America wish that this war is over too. And I have responsibility to them um, and to my colleagues that you just don't give up. I think, I'm not sure if I even answered your question, Simone, but I got wound up. So that's where I ended up. <laughs> Great answer. Beautiful answer. Anwar, I see you're unmuted. So it seems like you may be ready to, to re respond. Oh, I am ready to respond, but that's not why I'm unmuted. I think I forgot to get, be muted. But anyway, here I am. So, um, okay, a few best practices. And I know this because we did it the wrong way, so we learned how to do it the right way. A few things. Number one, go learn from other people and don't be proud. If you don't know, because a lot of people in these meetings pretend like they know stuff, they don't really know stuff. If you don't know it, don't fake it. Go up, find a nice person and ask them to help to teach you. What goes around, um, what, what comes around, goes around. Please learn. That's number one. We don't all have the answers and there's nothing wrong with not knowing everything. Number two, work with coalitions. Not because you need to, because you want to. When we go together in a room, um, I remember uh, the last time we were together, myself, Abby and uh, Dr. Cho, um, he was joking that this is the band, let's put the band um, together. And at the beginning of the meeting, I told Abby, hey, we put the band together, now we can have an additional member with Preet. Um, let's make these coalition, people walk in the room. And I remember one time somebody was asking, me, oh, let me explain who Ruth Messlinger is. And I'm just like looking at his face. And he's trying to apologize for having a Jewish person on the, on the panel with me at this unit. And I was like, excuse me, she's my sister. And I'm on several panels with her. And, and she was like, oh, I told my husband, once I found out you're here, I don't need to say stuff. I'll just let you talk first and I'll add to it. So we know each other. So they, they, people are assuming that religions hate each other. So when we work together, it just makes them really, hey, really? And I've been in meetings, I remember I was in a meeting with a Republican from Texas, a staff member, and he just couldn't get his mind over. So you do stuff with Jews here in America? Really? And he just, it just changed the whole conversation. And then suddenly he became interested in what we were saying. So I would say that if we can show a different part of faith, that faith can work together, love each other to make the world a better place, do that in coalition. The third thing is this, abide by the rules. 
especially if you're minority faiths or people of color. Okay? The IRS will come after you, okay? Um, I'm being really serious. <laughs> I'm being really serious. This was the advice I was given. I was given the advice by my uncle who was an auditor in Birmingham in England, 1993. And he said, Anwar, you got to be really careful with Islamic Relief in America. Why? He said, if they're going to come after you, they won't say it's because you're Muslim. It's because they're going to say you did something wrong in your taxes. And he said this, and many of the Muslim charities, about 27 Muslim charities approximately, have been shut down in America since 9-11. Some of the people who are distributing food to hungry people are in supermarkets in Colorado today. And their crime was feeding hungry people. It was in the Patriot Act, it's material support law. And many of us have forgotten about that. So I'm being very serious. If you are from a minority faith, minority color, please be even more careful. Everyone needs to abide by the rules. But certain people can get away with things, certain don't. Um, please make sure that you are abiding by the rules. I know this is really um, boring stuff, but this is how you also protect your civil rights. Don't give people an excuse if they hate you because of the way you look, that they can come after you from another uh, thing. Sorry, you can tell too much trauma, too many battle scars, but um, yeah, that's from me. It might be helpful. Go ahead, Breith, we're ready for yeah. you. I was just gonna kind of echo on that, right? Is, um, it, you know, you're, you're providing a resource and a service um, at the end of the day, and you're providing a resource and a service that's very, very important to people. Um, and so that comes with the responsibility of not being able to not pr provide one day. Um, you're becoming a place for reliance and, and a resource that's food, like what's more important than food. So, you know, something that we've internally been dealing with uh, and battling is how do we scale this? You know, how do we create something that uh, you don't get fatigued, where you have enough volunteers and backup support on your organization and you create that organization, like if you're treating it like a business, because at the end of the day, you know, you have to have that professionalism, you have to have that responsibility, holding people accountable um, you can't be shut down one day and people are lined up. There's hundreds of cars out there and there's no food or you're just not starting on time. Simple stuff like that. You know, ultimately, we have a responsibility. Once we've started something, you have that responsibility to keep going. Um, and I think, you know, any sized operation, it, it's tough. It, it, it can absolutely take a toll on you. And personally, I think it's the purpose, right? It gives me purpose to keep doing this work. Um, that's why I keep doing it. And that's why I want to keep doing it. And that's why I want to get more people involved. Um, I'm not expecting anything in return. Um, but I, I think getting gratitude afterwards, um, you know, it may be okay. That's a personal choice or a personal decision um, and feeling good about something, um, you know, but don't expect that going into it and, and you know, emphasize on the compassion showing people that, hey, even if, you know, people are showing up with, you know, a nice car and they're in line, it could be that they lost their job last year and they, they're at that point in life where you are not in a place to judge. Um, reminding people that we're not here to judge and we're here to serve and we're going to continue to serve no matter what. Um, you know, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a lot of like things are going to come up, but start somewhere. Just start serving and everything falls into place. I think that's the only advice or kind of you know life experience I would share. That's great. Thank you, Breathe. And over to you, Dr. Cho. It's the last word here. Yeah, well, thank you again. Apologies to Anwar for my insensitive laughter. It wasn't laughing at your trauma, brother. And I, uh, again, no. just um, know that uh, you and, and others have gone through things. Um, and uh, this is not for the, for the faint. This is hard work. And so apologies. I also just feel like I need to, we're talking about, about humility and I, I wanna be boastful of my uh, doctor title, but unfortunately I don't deserve a doctor title, uh, don't have a doctorate, uh, so, but you're still welcome to call me doctor if you guys want to. Uh, and then I, I wanna dispel the rumors about this band that Anwar spoke about, you know, Anwar, Abby and myself and now Preet is a part of our band. Uh, we're, we're having some some debates about who the lead singer shall be. And so we, we haven't gotten started yet, but we will 
we won't get to it. I, I've got a handful of things, and I hope that a couple of these might be might be helpful. But just really quick, uh, quick fire answers. Number one, I think we've got to make sure that whoever's watching, listening, all of us, that we personally embody these convictions. Um, I, I'm really sometimes weary of the fact that when you're in this work after a while, uh, we don't want to become peddlers. We don't want to become um, akin to a used car salesperson. Like it has to be a deep conviction. And I, I know for myself, there are times that when you're in the space for a long, long time and things get really wonky and really policy oriented, you sometimes might lose track, you lose sense of your mission. And there is such a thing as a nonprofit industrial complex. And after a while, we've got to make sure that we're not part of that complex where we pay, uh, where we're enslaved to a system. And so that's the first thing is let's make sure that uh, it becomes personal. Uh, and I think along that lines, let's be wary about the savior complex that we sometimes wrestle with. Uh, compassion is beautiful. It's what brought us here together. Uh, but I think this idea of mutuality, that we have so much to learn uh, from our sisters and brothers who might be uh, going through their own vulnerability and challenges, that we've got to be aware of the power dynamics, lest we fall into this savior complex, uh, whether it's domestic or international. Uh, and I also want to encourage people to think about what does it mean to be in this work for the marathon? I'm grateful that you're here, but we need you for the marathon. Uh, we need you 10 years from now, 20 years from now. This is not a one hit wonder. This is not a, a tribute to Millie Vanilli. Uh, I'm, I'm dating myself for those that love Millie Vanilli. If not, don't worry about it. But I, 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 I'm concerned because I do see people dropping off like flies. And there is a lot of just anxiety and stress. It's hard work. And sometimes it's okay to say, I'm going to rest for a time so that I can be back at this next Monday because we need one another for the marathon. I also wanna just encourage people of the importance of not dehumanizing people in this process. Uh, one of the most painful, cringy things for me is when you see people doing the work of justice unjustly, uh, when we somehow, um, we, 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 we exploit the stories of our vulnerable sisters and brothers. Um, I'm thinking and reminded of that uh, talk that uh, Chimamande Adichie and Gozi does uh, about the dangers of the single story. And if you were to apply that talk to how we sometimes perceive the poor, the hungry, whether it be here in our nation and around the world, I think we've got to be very, very careful. And I think one of the greatest remedies to that is genuine relationships. Like if we don't have relationships with the women, men, families, children, that we're seeking to serve and support, then I think um, it's very tempting and possible that we can be seduced into exploiting the stories of those who are vulnerable, that they're more than just that. Um, and the last thing that I would just share is uh, maybe a summation is, what does flourishing look like for you in this work that we do? Um, uh, we, uh, are, we care about food security because we believe that food is essential to human flourishing, to, to every single person. Uh, and I would also just um, encourage people to consider what that means for them as they go about this work. Um, uh, all over the place, but those are some things that come to mind for me. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, you know, the, the all over the place is exactly what I was looking for because instead of uh, having a prepared, refined answer, we just got a bunch of a bunch of nuggets from each of you. So, so thank you all for just sharing all of that with us. Um, I, I wanna move into the Q&A portion of our conversation. Um, and um, I don't wanna shortchange the panelists uh, because each of you has a ton to say about every one of the questions, but more importantly, I don't wanna shortchange the audience. And so I'll, I'll try and direct uh, a question to each of you so we can get through more of them. Um, and Abby, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, there's a question here about specific examples of collaboration. How have your organizations collaborated with one another? How can we think about collaboration that's mutually beneficial? Okay, that's so funny because I'm looking at these questions and I would not have pounced on that one, but I will answer that one. Um, but I just, I'm forewarned that there are a couple of these I'm gonna jump in on. Um, 
so the essence of the work that we do is about collaboration. We form coalitions and connections, um, oftentimes in connection with Islamic relief or bread for the world, but more often for us, because the work we are doing is rooted in these different kinds of populations that, so when we work on military hunger, we work a lot with military family support organizations. We work with military officers. Um, that's fun. Um, we in the tribal nations work we're doing we do with the tribal nations so that we are in a mix of, of other organizations i i would say that coalitions are both um an opportunity and a challenge and you i don't i mean given the, what i think is the level of sophistication of the audience here i don't want to pretend that you know life is all rosy and that we have to do is all just collaborate and everyone will just get along it'll be great I mean, that's not true um you lose control um and you lose the ability sometimes to move forward i think there was a question in here about innovation and being stuck and sometimes in coalition work you can get stuck because if you've got a big idea and it's a big, bold idea, you may have brought this coalition together because they all see the same need, but they may not see the same solution. And you know the length of time it can take to work to get to people to a, a shared idea is A, exhausting, and B, could be months, years into the future, and it's a compromise. So you know when you do our work, you know you are going to have to compromise at the highest levels in this country. No one gets everything that he or she asks for when they ask it of policymakers, and there's all that negotiating and back and forth. And you cannot, you cannot take for granted how hard it will be to get a policy change through when you're at that level by bogging yourself down in trying to get agreement at a community level. So there's a tension here. But on the other hand, you can't do this work alone. It's exhausting and you're limited in what you know. I mean, several of you and us have spoken about the idea like you got to know, you don't know everything. You want to hear from other people. You want to understand better. There are different cultures of uh, societal placement and work, not just those that we think of as culture in a more I mean, traditional sense. Um, so for us, sorry, the military is always a good example for me around this because it was born out of something I learned when I, my first year at Mazone, and I thought, oh, this would be so easy to fix. We should just fix this. And here we are 11 years later, still not fixed. Okay. So it, the military culture is so different from anything most of us experience in our day-to-day -day lives. And I don't know what that culture is. I had to learn and I had to listen and I had to have people who are steeped in that culture as a part of the discussion. They know nothing about food insecurity other than they're struggling, but they have no way of talking about it. So we offer them this and we understand where the levers of power are to push for that. So those collaborations are genius, right? They're wonderful, but they offer challenges too. Um, and um, I think there's these across issues too, right? where you want to collaborate with environmentalists, you want to collaborate with um, you know, people engaged in um, helping the unhoused and, you know, and, and then your issue can get lost. So I guess I'm the, the voice of caution a little bit. I think that the, the default for most of us is to work in collaboration. And then you want to do that um, knowing with your eyes open what you're walking into. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. And um, I've just been informed of a, of, a, of a slight shift in plan where we don't have as much time for Q&A as I had hoped. And I, I apologize for that. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes, though. And what I would like to do is, is invite each of the panelists to share a final word um, and, you know, would love to hear anything from you in terms of uh, why this work matters to you, what advice you have to give people who are uh, working uh, to grow into this world. Uh, or what you would like to see in the future. So maybe maybe Anwar, we can we can pass it over to you to to give us your final thoughts here. When we pray, when we read our scripture, and when we do our worship, that's about improving ourselves. 
when we feed others and help others, it's about changing society and seeing what affect our prayers and all of the knowledge we gained as people of faith, what effect it had. If we go to sleep at night and we haven't changed the world and made it a better place, we wasted a day. No problem. Get up tomorrow morning and do a better job. Thank you. Thank you. I love that. Uh, Eugene, your way. Uh, well, first, uh, we're going to be releasing our album next month. So check us out on Spotify and make sure you get a few downloads. No, I think all kidding aside, um, you know, I think we are having a, just a, a really delightful conversation. I think we can also acknowledge this work is hard. It's also really complex. The issues are complex. And Abby alluded to some of those complexities. It's important for us to acknowledge those complexities. It's really hard marathon work. I, I would love for us to perhaps, uh, at least for my final thoughts, to really elevate the importance of empathy for our hearts to remain tender, uh, our hearts to remain vigorous and committed. Because even as we speak, uh, we know that there are children uh, in the wealthiest nation in the world, in every single community that are affected uh, by a lack of food, and not just a lack of food but a lack of food nutrition as well. And when we talk about gas prices and we talk about uh, food prices going up, the reality is when my wife and I go to the market uh, and we don't live in a food desert, there's six large markets within a mile radius of where we are. Uh, we complain, we whine about egg prices and meat prices because they've all gone up. But when it's all said and done, just to be fully transparent, we buy whatever we want and need. Because uh, that's the privilege that we have. And that's not the reality for millions of our neighbors in our nation. And then I know that we're focusing on US, but I think about the larger world. And there are communities where they spend anywhere from 50 to 75% of their income on food. And with food prices going up, it literally becomes a matter of life and death. So empathy, I know it's hard. I know we don't have all the easy answers, but in order for us to do this work with uh, thoughtfully, passionately, um, with dignity, and even joyfully, may our hearts be engaged, may it remain soft. Blessings to all. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, Preet, if you wanna offer us your final word here. Yeah. Um... I think, you know, um, I wanna just maybe put out there, if you have a passion for this work, if you have a passion for giving back or, you know, food insecurity or just doing anything, just do it, just start. Don't be afraid, right? It's that whole concept of being entrepreneurial and just start with doing what you can. You're gonna learn along the way. You're gonna make mistakes, a hundred thousands of mistakes you will make. Everybody does and that's okay because that's how you learn. Um, that's how I learned. I'm still learning. We're still learning. We don't know what we don't know. No, I know you'll never not know everything, um, but it's, it's, it, you, you'll never know everything. In partnerships with food banks, grocery stores, distributions, right? That's how we grew. And we had to just start. We got shut down so many times, but the more and more you do it, the you, you, were, you learn ways. Budgets. I saw some Q&A um, you know, um, responses to say, hey, how do we go about budgets for faith-based? Um, you know, we found different ways, private donors, corporate sponsors, and there are other ways and grants to go about that that are focused for that. Um, money is important to, yes, run an organization, but I think if you have the passion, you'll make it work. Um, and that's how, you know, I think we've done it. I would love to um, be available as a resource to anyone that wants to um, learn more about how to starting, how to start a food pantry. Um, there are so many partnerships that and, and programs that empower you and give you the resources on power um, giving to the community as a food pantry. Um, and food banks are the biggest and easiest way to start. It will take time to maybe get approved, but you got to start somewhere. So if you put your name on the waiting list now, it will happen. Um, and I'm open, you know, if my contact information is out there, just, just reach out to me. I'm happy and would love to share and guide anybody that might be interested in it. Thank you, Bree. Thank you. That's super generous of you. Uh, and Abby, 
final I'm words. I'm conscious yeah. that we have very little time, so I'm going to be succinct. I think that it's really important to tap into those entrepreneurial skills if you have them, that you have to be bold. You have to have both compassion and wisdom, that none of these qualities can exist in a vacuum. You need them all. This federal government spends $90 billion a year on its nutrition programs, 90 billion. There is no charitable response that comes close to that, nor will it ever. It fills gaps. This is why we turn our attention to the policymakers in Washington, DC. This is their job. It is not our job. As we innovate, as we think forward, as we struggle with what are the answers here, the answers are theirs to implement. It are ours to suggest and to urge, as Anwar says, but it's their responsibility. And in a democracy, they answer to us. And we have to keep holding them accountable and moving this needle forward. And when you get tired, talk to one of us. We all get tired and we can all work together to lift each other up. And that's the most brilliant form of collaboration and coalition is to hold us up and keep us moving when it gets really dark and really difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. Really, really grateful for your time. Uh, and thank you to everyone who was able to stay. I know we went a little bit over. I'm grateful to the organizers who have given me the grace to go over a little bit. And um, now I just want to close us out. I want to pass it over to Elliot Gaskins, who's uh, a colleague and now, now a friend through our working together. So Elliot, over to you. Thank you, Sim, Ron, for your great moderation today. And thank you, Abby, Eugene, Anwar, and Preet for your very enriching conversation. I know I, for one, and I hope all of our, our attendees got a lot from the conversation. So thank you. And thank you all of you who attended and all of you who stayed on. During this time of year, when so many special moments for various faiths are converging, I hope you all find time for moments of reflection and moments to find gratitude. I hope you all stay tuned to the Post Fireside Chat. Will be a brief conversation uh, hosted by me and Katie Workman to provide some quick reflections and perspective on what we just heard. No need to register, just click on the link that we've provided in the chat. And stay tuned for the recording and the post summary to action report that we will send out. Please share it widely. We have some great conversations on tap coming up in the coming weeks, including discussions on food justice and media and food insecurity on college campuses. So a lot of great content and conversations coming up in the future. We look forward to seeing you again in a few weeks. And if you can join us for the post conversation. Thank you very much and take care.